So I met you in 2016 mm -hmm. at the Feminine Power Retreat. Yes. In Berkeley, California, Berkeley. which is about as crunchy as it gets. Um, and that's an online course that we had been taking for about nine months. And I remember seeing your um, photo and your little introduction on the online forum right at the beginning and being so excited to discover another artist yeah. there. Um, because most of the other women in the course were doing it for either some personal reasons or to train, to be a coach. And so it's something that we talked about often is that it's quite hard to find a community or a place to go that caters to both things. Um, and I remember watching you and hearing you perform uh, there and just being completely blown away and really wanting to be your friend, but being a bit shy. And there was a little place they encouraged us um, to write notes to, I think, three of the women. And I wrote you a little note about how amazing I thought you were. <laughs> um, and then I saw you again the next year at a different Feminine Power Retreat. Um, and I think you made me cry. I did. Yeah, you did. You <laughs> in a good way. Cry. In a good way. <laughs> <laughs> by seeing seeing me and the things that I wanted to do and we ended up in the elevator alone in the elevator together and I just remember you saying I feel like we're meant to be friends <laughs> and I said yeah me too uh, and it was just like being at school I can't believe I said that it's so like forward <laughs> like you be my friend I know it was like being asked out on a date it was brilliant <laughs> But like maybe Amazing. when you're 13. Yeah. Yeah. At least yeah, I yeah. didn't get my friend to ask you. Like, right, 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 right. Yeah, that would have been good. <laughs> yeah. And I still have that little note somewhere at you home. You do? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, I do. so nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you were living in, still living, were you in England then or Palm Springs? Um, I had been living in LA, but mm. I'd gone back to England because we had like a year where our visas got, uh, took a it took a year to get our visas right. so I was at the, that point kind of in England and feeling a little bit stuck because mm -hmm. I felt like my life should be in LA yeah um but you know the visa people didn't agree right right and uh, I remember seeing your little name tag of like Emma from LA and I was like oh hello are you from LA I, I live in LA too and I was just like oh my god I'm such a geek <laughs> this woman must think I'm so um you know over friendly and then I just you know approach you in a lift and ask you to be my friend <laughs> I don't know how this has lasted this long <laughs> and here we are but yeah here we are we've been friends <laughs> and collaborators yeah actually yeah which is really fun yeah um so we was Yes, we collaborated on the video for Here As Raw, mm -hmm. which we, which was really fun because we got to use the feminine power principles yes. um, as a way of creating. And I think that was the happiest I'd been in a really, really long Aww. time. Yeah, it was really fun for me to be back in that creative space. Um, I had recently had my second child i remember i remember placing an instacart order on my phone as in the middle of kind of running around town with shoving camera in my face um yeah it was really it was just so delightful to be performing again and creating again but doing it in a way that was just so relaxed and casual and and in the flow really mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the way that we created that video was really magical in that we felt into what it was supposed to be rather yeah. than kind of placing any kind of like egoic kind of like, I think it should be like this. It was very much like we just sat with it, had a vision of what it should be and like let it take its, mm. its form. And I think that actually probably was like, and in, a real induction for me into like how to do that. And it was the first song of our 12 songs in 12 month challenge that we did. And I think it definitely sort of got me started into that kind of just feeling into mm. 
creations because they do have a bit of a life of their of their own and they kind of have it's almost like I don't know having a baby and it's born into the world and it has its own personality and right. you're like what <laughs> right, <laughs> I made right, you right. I made you <laughs> like it's like that and it, it wants to take its own shape and its own form and sort of like letting that happen has been quite a powerful um process mm. definitely uh, I also um collaborated with you on another video or the song Fly, which comes towards the end of the album, mm. not at the very end, but it's further along. And I realised that without thinking about it, we had sort of continued the story of this woman. Yeah. So in the video over here, as Raw, um, I started kind of trapped in the house, but having visions of this um, open space on the top of a hill, and you see them kind of flashing... Um, through her mind until she literally just makes a run for it and mm -hmm. starts running through the city of Los Angeles and running and running and running and running until she eventually gets to the top of the hill to the place where to, she's been the place that she's been seeing in her visions um, and it's a big smile on her face and the vista of LA out, out below her and then in Fly I'm just rolling around in the dirt yeah. in the top of a canyon in Topanga <laughs> and dancing and dancing through a labyrinth. Um, yeah, again, another lovely creative process where, well, in both cases, you asked me to listen to the song and then see, just kind of see what ideas came. Um, and there's something about your music that makes me want to run. I don't know what it is. I just suddenly think, I, I, I see running, I see running. Um, so that kind of featured in both. Um, it's so funny that you see that because Frankie really wants to do slow motion running in like every video. Oh, really? It's like every time she's like, oh, is this the one for the slow motion running? <laughs> And like sometimes when she's had a few too many drinks, she gives me a camera. And she's like, just, just film me. <laughs> <laughs> she loves you it. You have to do one. We have to do a yeah. video where it's just like that. At the end of the album, it's just Frankie slow motion running <laughs> to the bar. <laughs> yes, it would be to the bar. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, it, it's yeah. it's it's a beautiful um, transition to, from the character where she started to like this amazing freedom at the mm. end it's like such a poignant journey I think. yeah we sort of showed without really thinking about yeah, it yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah she came back to life mm. she had more to say maybe she'll have even more to say yeah we'll have to see maybe she will see what happens <laughs> to her <laughs> um i remember actually when you first sent me the track heroes roar that i was alone in the house and I just thought okay I'll just put my headphones in or I don't even know if I did I thought okay I'll just listen to this on my phone you know not like great speakers or anything um so I'm listening I'm imagining running and then the part of the song came in that's the bridge or the middle eight where Frankie's voice goes up into this incredibly ethereal beautiful place and everything kind of gets very wavy, for want of a better way of describing it. And I just burst into tears. And it was such a powerful experience, and I, I had no idea why, but when I told you about it, you had something to say about that. Yeah. So when I wrote those lyrics, um, I was specifically kind of tuning into, like, women's empowerment and women's sort of liberation and awakening. And... When it came to us recording the song, um, and especially that piece of it, actually, um, I deliberately kind of, I don't know if the word is programmed, I deliberately infused mm. um, like a doorway to release all of the ancestors that have come before anyone who listens to um the piece, um, all of the ancestors, the female ancestors who'd felt oppressed or stuck 
um, and hadn't been able to reach that kind of awakening or liberation to allow them to pass over mm. Mm. Um, into the light. So mm. it was just an experiment. I'd never done that before mm. <laughs> until that moment. And I kind of just did it um, and didn't think much more of it until you sent me that message. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, there we go. It's worked. <laughs> it's amazing. And did anyone else yeah. report a reaction? Um, no. But it would be interesting me. to see if anyone else, you know, did feel mm. anything when listening to that song. Yeah. I mean, that song definitely had a big impact and we had a lot of good response from mm. it and people found it powerful. And also lots of different communities found it powerful. So whilst I wrote it in terms of women's awakening, I think it also really applies to like the gay community mm. and any other communities that have felt oppressed and... Um, in need of that kind of that kind of boost into liberation and empowerment mm, mm. yeah so with that song you really brought together the musician part of you and the medium part yeah that was the first no, it wasn't the first one. <laughs> no, I mean, it was the first time I did that, did that. But yeah, I'd been playing around with doing that for the, uh, about a year or two before that. Mm. Um, and it's something that, yeah, I, I don't really write in any other way now. It's always mm. a kind of fusion of the two mm. together. Yes. And can you talk a little bit about... Um, your process of writing lyrics when you've told me in the past that it's really a more of a channeling experience yeah it's different every song is different um like I say every kind of creation has its own like personality mm -hmm. and it has a different way that it wants to be born um but it's always it's always very much um a s sort of a spiritual experience that feels like it's bigger than me mm. um, and I have different guides that I work with that um, that come in and 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 sort of help and uh, I have I have one guide which is like she's very like poetic and uses a lot of nature as um, mm. nature symbolism um, and then I connect in with like the spirits of legends that have passed like mm. like John Lennon a lot of the time um and it's interesting because like I don't think you'd look at my lyrics and go oh that stinks of John Lennon right. <laughs> <laughs> not at all um but the way it works is it just ignites a certain thing in me so like that ignites my kind of revolutionary spirit right, right. I think and then the the other guy with the nature she sort of links into my my own connection with nature and my mm. own empowerment that happens with nature and and brings out those parts of me yeah um so yeah it's always it's always a kind of spiritual experience and then when when I wrote wild woman the lyrics to wild mm. woman mm. I um had just started doing the feminine power work and um connecting with our the community which was just like the most you know um expansive experience yeah. i think doing that that work and i'd also started doing kundalini yoga for the first time so mm. it was very and if you haven't done kundalini yoga before it's very um they're very into the divine feminine right, right. and um so i was very just i was expanding into that kind of myself at the time um and i called on um all of the feminine power community as I wrote those lyrics and I felt them circling around me mm. and sort of like helping and like channeling their energy in and, and like dancing around I could sense them right. like almost like you know witches dancing around a fire yeah, like yeah. that kind of imagery and the lyrics just came like I don't even remember writing them I mean I know I, I know it came out of my fingers but like it was not me at right, all right. Um, and when we wrote that song and I was just like, oh my God, this is the best song I've ever written. And I just thought that the whole world would like be like as excited about it as I was. And we'd play it at places and 
I'd be like, why are people not reacting like I yeah. thought they were going to? They'd just be like, meh, meh, cool, cool tune. Um, and then it was only when I sang it at the Feminine Power Retreat and everyone went mental and like mm. jumped out of their seats and were like screaming and yeah. ran over. And I was like, there we go. Right. <laughs> this is right, uh, right, the reaction right. I had imagined. Um, and yeah, I'm sure it is because they were all there with me when I wrote it. Right. Yeah. Well, and also I think, you know, it, sometimes it can feel like there's not a lot of media out there for people like us, as it were. Like, it's quite, you know, a lot of the music you listen to, I mean, if you just turn on the radio, you know, it's all about love or, you know, everyday life or being in a nightclub or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not a great deal of music out there that really speaks to being on an evolutionary journey or being an awakening woman. Of course, actually now, that is... You know, even just in the few years since I heard you perform that song, yeah. things have changed so much. We've had Me Too, and um, there are obviously a lot of powerful female and male singers who who are kind of singing these empowerment songs. But that it's the spiritual part mm. in particular that I never, I never feel like that side of me is represented and particularly not on screen you know and that's yeah. something that I, that has really bothered me for a long time is that I and I don't really watch much tv anymore I go to the cinema sometimes but I've never seen myself up on screen I've never seen someone with my concerns my weird idiosyncrasies <laughs> or my my spiritual drive yeah um, and it's something that I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have to do that then, right? I'm going to have mm -hmm. to write it. Um, and that's something that's definitely um, it, in the pile of things that I want to do yeah. in life. But, um, do you know, I think that that's where the world is heading. Like, when we first started having these conversations, it was before all the Me Too mm. stuff and like the world was a completely different place and it's incredible how it, we've been friends for three years and in that three years yeah. like everything has changed and like Hollywood has changed yeah movies are changing you know like we're starting to hear much from a much more diverse range of people mm -hmm. and their about their stories yeah. and yeah, yeah, it yeah. may not be yet of a spiritual nature but it's definitely of a transformational nature yeah. I think yeah, yeah. and then I think the spiritual nature is just the next step yeah Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. It's an exciting time to kind of witness. Yeah. And see how, you know, I think I'm really, really proud actually of Hollywood, especially like movies and TV, how they have um, really embraced this kind of new mm. um, emergence of like, of kind of societal evolution, I think it is. Right. I think music's a little bit behind, but we're catching up. Mm. And, and yeah, I think the next step is definitely of, a more spiritual nature for sure yeah is Frankie spiritual it's funny someone asked her that the other day and she said it really well she said um she said something like I don't practice I don't practice but I believe it mm. or something right, right. um yeah she's not she yeah, she's, she doesn't think that she is, but she is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just think she has a slightly different path to right. to me. But, um, yeah, there's a part of her spirit that's, like, so huge. And, like, I've, I've always noticed when I introduce her to my friends who are spiritual, like, they all have a really similar reaction where they get, like, really um, silly and fun <laughs> and, like... And it's funny how she has that react. She has that effect on people, like because her spirit is just like very free and fun. Like I remember one time before we were even together, I think being on the beach with her, and she was just doing like cartwheels and like shouting <laughs> and laughing, and um, she's just like that that person. So her, I feel like her spiritual ness is kind of rooted in in like fun and right. um, freedom of spirit, but also her creativity is so spiritual even though she doesn't realize yeah. um like she wouldn't 
say it in these words, but when she creates, it's incredible. Like, um, she, A, doesn't remember doing it. So like, <laughs> it's not, it's not just her. And, um, yeah, she has this, she has this ability to kind of tune into somebody else mm. and create exactly what they need. So like, often when we create songs like we did um, with Wild Woman, um, for example, I would get a sense of like what the song wants to be. And I'd be like, I feel like it, like, it sounds a bit like it's coming from the earth and like there's all this rumbling and then it like does this and I'll start making all these like hand gestures and I don't form a sentence. I'll right. be going, and it's a bit like, but then it's like, and I'll just like say random words at her and like, or like mm -hmm. make sounds at her. And somehow she manages to create exactly what I had in my head. Right, right. And I've watched her do that. Um, sometimes we do co-writes with other people and it's not just that she's very in tune with, with me. It's like she can literally tune in with whoever she's with and like yeah. create sort of like, um, it's almost like she creates a um, avatar of what their spirit is trying to say mm. and puts it into music. It's fair. Mm -hmm. She's very clever like that. <laughs> I mean, obviously, creativity is inherently a, a spiritual experience, mm. right? Um, and even if you're not a quote-unquote spiritual person, everybody recognises the thing called flow and that state that we get into. And, mm. um, but I think what, what I find really interesting about you and one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is that it's not just about the process it's about the intention so having a sp specifically spiritual intention with what you do because you can create um you know you can be zen while creating an advert right but the, mm -hmm. the intention of, of the advert is to sell you something mm. it's not to transform consciousness <laughs> or further human awakening um and i think that's that's what I always get really excited when I find someone is doing that because I really feel like, you know, that's the next level. Mm. You know? Yeah, it's funny. I've always felt like that was my reason for being here. Like even when I was a, like a kid or like mm. a teenager, um, I didn't know how or like why or anything, but I just knew it was really important to me that what I did in the world was like, of an inspirational nature to others right. or like something yes, that would yes. touch others yes. and like transform yes them somehow yeah. and like that's always the best um feedback we get from fans and stuff right. when they when they yes. get in touch and say this thing that you said or this thing that you wrote or whatever has yeah. changed my life yeah, yeah. or like I listen to your song every morning to get me in like the right mood for the day and stuff mm. like that that's just like the best yeah. things to hear that's like why I'm here for sure that's what I want want to be doing in the world it's so interesting I used to have this problem when I was trying to when I was still just trying to come up with ideas for a novel or something I would just think yeah I could do that but why like what is mm. the point why it's pointless um I can't see the point of it and if I don't see the point of it no one else is going to experience <laughs> a point um and I tried to explain that to people and, and nobody really got it but the image that I would always have is that you know the end of this it's incredibly time consuming and laborious this process so it's like at the, at the least a year more like two probably mm. until you're actually giving a reading and I'd always just imagine myself there I am in, in Barnes and Noble like and I've just I've just finished right like <laughs> I've read my novel and I and I look up and I just see, you know, like 35 people being exactly the same as they were. Mm. Like nothing happened. And that's what that's what would happen in this kind of fantasy, I suppose. Um I'm like something is supposed to happen. Yeah. As a result of this and it nothing has happened. Um and I think that's what I was kind of picking up on and then at some point as I was trying to work with this kind of imagery I was like yeah it's it's almost like 
wanting to have a fuse or like a live wire, right? It's this electrical mm. thing and it's going to have, it's going to touch this person and light them up and then go around all yeah. of them and like something's going to be lit up. Um, so, yes, I think I, I, with the book that I wrote, um, actually somebody did write to me recently to say that, um, it kept them entertained during a long wait for a train. And I'm like, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> I wasn't trying to write anything spiritual at that point. But I did, But the piece that I wrote um, that was very specifically an allegory of awakening, which is called Satanic Airlines Flight 666 to Hell. Um, a friend, I had a friend who was going through an awakening um, and it was a rough one he reported that the piece really, really helped him. And I think that's one of the most rewarding feelings. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. I, f I feel like in some ways, the audience for this new kind of work that I am doing is at this stage quite small, even though there is potentially, you know, th there's a huge audience for... Um, self-help there's a huge audience for I mean Eckhart's books have sold millions um The Untethered Soul I think was probably in the bestseller list for a long time so there there obviously are people out there there are several yeah. millions of people um out there but I think it's almost like a sideways stepping sideways or something that's the direct route right that's the direct okay here's a book on um spiritual awakening and how you might aw awaken and if you're looking to further your consciousness like read this how-to book mm. right or it's the kind of theory and it's the direct message um and i think what we're talking about is is the i don't know how we you how would you even describe it? Like a kind of, it's encoded somehow. It's translated into a different form and it affects you maybe on a different level. I yeah. think maybe that's part of it, that, that there's, when you, read, um, when you read a spiritual book or you watch a spiritual video, your brain is processing the information in the way that it processes other Mm -hmm. sort of like just information right versus um when something comes through an art form it's coming at you through your emotions it's coming at you through your subconscious yeah. it's like a different just a different way in yeah it speaks to your soul and mm. it's like any art speaks to your soul anyway mm. and awakens you yeah. in some in yes. some way doesn't it and, and like enlightens you and opens you up so to have art that is of a transformative, um, a transformative of consciousness nature, that's hard to say. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, that's even more, even more powerful. And it comes in beyond the ego, doesn't it? It comes in underneath, mm. underneath the ego and underneath yeah. the, the mind and, and right into your, right straight into your soul. So yeah. it's, it's super yeah. powerful. Um, I just suddenly remembered the experience I had, um, reading Wendell Berry's poem um oh, of course the name's just gone out of my mind now um the piece of wild things mm. is that what it's called um and I it's funny when I was a kid I used to write poetry I used to enjoy writing poetry mostly just when an English teacher asked me to write a poem but I really enjoyed it and I wrote songs when I was a teenager I wanted to be a rock star for a while um, and I was in a band, but I was too afraid to sing loudly. Mm. So I just kind of mumbled into the microphone. Um, but I loved poetry and I often thought about writing poems. And I thought, I can't, I can't be a poet. Um, until I did the Write Into Light course. And because the deadlines for that were so short and the word, um, the word count was a maximum of 500 words, mm. that more often than not ended up being a poem sometimes it would be like a blog post piece that i would write you know this was for the for the written exercises um but so i went through this kind of 
awakening to poetry mm. phase. And there's something, again, about poetry in particular as an art form that really, it's almost like being on a drug, the way that it, because it plays and messes with language in this way that, that kind of, you know, it'll use one of your senses as a metaphor for another. And so you're kind mm -hmm. of like, your brain is being tickled and your senses are being kind of, like messed around with um, and it can be quite an incredible experience and so I was in London in Foyle's bookshop which is one of my favorite places on earth and I headed off into the poetry section and, and I just saw this book um, facing me and I thought I need to pick up that book mm. so I picked it up and I opened it to the title poem and it's one of the most exquisite poems I've ever read. And that I had the experience. So Emily Dickinson said that when she read really good poetry, it was like the top of her head blew off, which is what you and I would call having a crown chakra experience. Uh -huh. And that's exactly what I had um, reading this poem by the time I got to the end of it was just, you know, all the hairs on my arm sitting in it and then just this since this like massive opening sensation in my crown wow. chakra, I was like, oh! <laughs> um, so I bought myself that. Um, yeah, so I don't remember how I got to talking about crown chakras and poetry now, but um, I think it was just this idea of the way that, that it's a different experience receiving this kind of activating, consciousness-raising juice mm. um, through an art form versus yeah. versus through um, non-fiction, just sort of factual information. Mm. Although, um, I remember reading, recently I read, um, or maybe it was a, a video, I think it was one of Eckhart Tolle's videos, but he was talking about how some books written in the state of presence have somehow the quality of presence has made it into the words of the book and he doesn't know how mm. but that when you read it it has the power to draw you into presence yeah like his stuff does yes the minute exactly. you read his words you're like Whoa, yeah. just there yeah. and amazing yeah 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 and you're an Eckhart fan when mm. did you discover Eckhart. Um, I got into Eckhart, I guess like maybe two, <laughs> I think maybe like two years into my sort of journey with all of this, I really felt like I needed to and wanted to. So I like mm -mm. bought the books, but I was so not ready for them because mm. I think when you're not ready for Eckhart, you don't like, it doesn't even go in your brain. You're just like, what is he talking about? I thought yeah. about what I'm having for dinner and not read this page like 50 times yes um yes yeah so I would try and read it for ages um but I think it really really hit me oh probably about six years ago and yeah the biggest thing for me with him was was the kind of learning about um the sep the separation between the ego and the I always forget we had this conversation the other day what he calls con it's conscious is he call it consciousness hmm. the separation between ego and consciousness mm. and um, yeah that was just everything mm. and I really wish that the whole world could be taught that like in schools I wish yes. we could be taught that when we were yes. kids and yes. and had an understanding because my ego wants something completely different to my consciousness like every mm, single mm, day mm, mm. and like if I hadn't have learned that I would be in a completely different mm. place in my life right now probably not a good one yeah <laughs> and it's yeah it's the most powerful thing and then that book A New Earth was just um mind-blowing I started reading it again last year actually and it seems so relevant right mm. now as well it's it's one of those books that you can keep reading and Mm -mm. get new things from yes that's what he was saying in that little talk about how some people have read those books of his even you know seven eight nine ten times and get something new mm. it's funny what you say about not being ready for Eckhart because I remember my mum giving me the power of now 
um, several, maybe about two years before my awakening. And I was just lying on her sofa and I was reading it. And I was getting really frustrated because I could tell I was doing it wrong because I was trying to get to the end of the book. And I was like, <laughs> I had enough, you know, spiritual education and awareness to know that I, that was definitely missing the point of what was going on here. <laughs> and it, I got so mad that I threw it across the room. Like I literally oh threw the book God. across the room. And I was like, um, And it was a long time actually before I could kind of get back into the power of now. And it was, re it was a new earth that, that mm. did it for me. And it was, um, I mean, I wrote about it, but on this in the, within my spiritual awakening <laughs> as it was happening and I was going for a walk and and being blown away by um the way that all of the trees and shrubs looked and I was in this kind of heightened state I met my friend Tom uh, who was a neighbor at the time who I'd actually met filming something he was an actor and he said um I said, you know, Tom, I'm having this thing with the trees. I have this thing. And, it, I, and he said, oh, yes. Um, Eckhart, Eckhart had a thing with the trees when he first had his awakening. I've got the book. Why don't you pop round afterwards? You know, it's like, go and do your thing. I was like, yeah, I've got to go and, see, got to go and sit in Hyde Park and look at the trees now. Um, but then he gave me the book. And amazingly, it was right it was just after Oprah and Eckhart had started their webinar. So I mm. maybe missed the first two episodes of that and I caught up with that. And then I was kind of involved in that mm -hmm. first run of that. And it was amazing. And then what I didn't realize until years later is that um, I was spending a lot of time in Adam's flat in um, Russell Square as I was reading that book. Um, and it wasn't until later that I realized that that's, that's where he sat. No way. sitting. I mean, I was in a flat overlooking a square, but that Russell Square was where he sat on the bench for two years wow. and just looked at how how amazing everything oh was. My so God. Um, I really felt like I was kind of in the vortex of that. But you know, Eckhart has been a huge, huge part of mm. the awakening experience for me. Yeah. And in fact, um, I remember when I was pregnant and I was past my due date. I just finished building the last piece of furniture. It was the um, the stand for the bassinet. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, it was like 6 p.m., I'm a bit tired. I'm gonna lie down and watch an Eckhart video. And the one I picked was something about um, overcoming obstacles, I think, mm. something like, and then my contraction started. <laughs> like, okay, here we go. Here's my, my spiritual practice. Oh my God. For obstacles, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Eckhart does home pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other teachers? Have you found any, you know, kind of, who, who, who do you look to as an artist or a musician who's doing what it is you're trying to do? and what we're talking about here. There's a combination of, of like all different, you know, different musicians and um, teachers yeah. that I kind of piece things together from, definitely. Yeah, so um, I think I learned a lot from Liz Gilbert mm. with her big magic stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she talks a lot about um, creativity and the sort of, I don't know, I guess I guess she kind of talks about the spirit of creativity, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. And like, that really helped me understand what I was doing and like, because I felt like this force wanted to come through me very mm. much with when it came into sort of becoming an artist and becoming a songwriter and... Um, it was really hard to understand. Like, I was like, what is this? Like, what is this that's taking over me? Um, and like, why do I have to make sure I live this creative life? I mean, I learned it so hard. I got it tattooed on my arm, create every day. Right. Because I knew that, like, that is what I have to do to be mm. happy. And um, yeah, I, it's interesting. The work that she that she's done around creativity is, mm. is really kind of helpful in, in understanding how it... It works and also that book um what's it called the artist's way mm. that was really transformational yeah. too 
Um, I actually yeah. had, yeah, that had a, a, a profound effect on me in a surprising way. Um, that's really when I first started journaling. Mm. Like that's where the whole journaling practice came from. And, and everybody I know who's done that book has kind of, left me nobody likes the artist date like nobody likes having to go take themselves on an artist date and I have some horror stories yeah. of me going off on my own to an artist date um but that 20 minutes when you first mm-hmm. wake up just garbage that's in your brain morning pages you know, morning pages yeah like, that changed my life more than anything else and not necessarily then mm. um but later but it was so I was in my mid-20s and when I started that practice, that was was when I realized just how angry I was because mm. it would come out all caps. Like it was oh, just like wow. scrawling all caps across the page. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. There's a lot of anger inside here. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then I was going through a really, really tough time. And um, I was really, it was a very dark night of the soul. And... It was the evening and I was there scrolling and scrolling and so angry. And I don't remember what I was saying, but it was that feeling of being on my knees, looking up to the gods saying, how could you do this to me? Mm -hmm. How, 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 how? And in such a loud rage and not realizing it. And it was loud in my head, you know, I'm not Mm. making any noise. Um... And I don't know what triggered it, but then all of a sudden, the noise just completely shut out. And it was completely stunning. I was stunned and I felt myself to be surrounded by a pocket of silence. And then I heard a voice from inside my chest say, I've always been here. Wow. And I don't know how long it took me to come out of that Mm. stunned state or what I did afterwards. Um, And I remember telling my mom about it. And I'm glad I did because within a few weeks it felt like that didn't, I forgot it. Mm-hmm. And I, I have forgotten that experience. The weird thing is, you would think this would be the biggest, most memorable experience of someone's life, but actually I kept forgetting it. Mm. It's like, it's so outside of my experience or our experience that it's like the brain can't process it and can't register it. But one thing that I found really amazing was when I discovered that that having a voice in your chest that's how Eckhart describes what happened to him on his awakening night there he was the darkest night of the darkest Mm. darkest night of the soul um and he thought I can't live with myself anymore and then he thought who is the self that cannot live with this other one perhaps (laughs) they're just one um and he said he felt himself being pulled into a vortex and he heard a voice and he says from within his chest wow. saying, resist nothing. And then he doesn't remember what happened to him. He got mm. sucked into a vortex and then he remembers waking up the next day and everything seemed beautiful. And he didn't even realize, he didn't know. He didn't think, oh, I've had an awakening. Like it took him two years. But also in Eat, Pray, Love, in the beginning of Eat, Pray, Love, yeah. when Elizabeth Gilbert tells the story of being on the bathroom floor on her knees, crying and crying, crying, begging God, please tell me what to do. The same thing. Everything becomes quiet. There's a voice, it's simple, and it comes from within her chest. Wow. It says, go back to bed, Liz. That's amazing. So, I don't know what that is, but, um, yes, thanks to the artist's way. But, so, I'm curious, as a medium I'm not a medium I would consider myself an intuitive I get psychic clashes sometimes but um and I I might feel like I'm tuning into something but it's always you know my own it feels like my own thoughts but do you 
do you have any experience of this voice in the chest or any like how does that compare to mm. your experiences as a medium first of all i'd say you are a medium <laughs> <laughs> because honestly i believe everyone is a medium and you definitely are i've ex experienced it firsthand <laughs> um i should just say we have done readings for each other yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. i think the thing about mediumship is that like because of the way our culture is we just don't get taught that that's right. what we're doing right. and when i right. learned i was just like oh i've been doing this my whole life mm. like i just mm. didn't realize that's what it was and it's when you do the training and stuff you start to differentiate between different you know the different voices and the different energies mm. that are around you but um yeah everyone everyone is a medium that's mm. why that's what i believe but um it's interesting the chest thing i don't really get it in my chest I don't I don't get it in my chest mm. um it's yeah I'm trying to remember like the first okay this is the very first experience I had of, of learning about mediumship was when I started training and I was doing these classes and it was like everything was opening up really fast I started to like really feel how much of an empath I was and how much I felt other people's feelings all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, things were coming at me really fast. When you when you sort of start to realise that, you start to, like, hold it all even more. And you're like, oh, my God, this is, like, so heavy to hold mm -hmm. all of this. Um, you know, holding everybody's feelings, holding um, the energies that were around mm -hmm. you, especially, you know if you live somewhere where there's a lot of energy, different energies. Um, but yeah, the first sort of, I used to sit and meditate and as I closed my eyes in like the darkness of my eyes, I could see another eye looking back at me mm. and it would start really far away mm. and it would get closer and closer and closer and closer. Mm. And um, it felt like a really familiar eye, but it wasn't mm. my eye. Mm. And um, I could literally see it there. Mm. It was so strange. Um, and I remember saying to my teacher at the time, I was like, what is this? And he was like, well, it's your, I think it's your spirit guide trying to sort of con connect with you. And the more, so I, once I kind of accepted that as an explanation, I sort of started to connect with this eye more and the eye became a face. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that face sort of disappeared and I stopped seeing it in that way, but I could start to hear and feel the thoughts, mm. feel, feel the mm. thoughts and the feelings of, um, of this, of this being. And then, um, and then, and then you start to really get to know that being. And then when there's another one, you start to feel that, oh, that's a different right. feeling. Yes. And yes. so it's just like a really long process of like, a, knowing yourself, knowing what's you and what's mm, your voice, mm, mm, mm. and then knowing the be the beings, the energies that are around you mm. that work with you and kind of starting to recognise them. And um, and then once you kind of get that really clear, you can start to work with other people mm. and their, all of their beings that they have around right, them. Right, right, right. Um, and go to different places and, and tune into the spirits of different places. And it's this incredible new world that just kind of mm. opens up um but yeah it didn't come from my chest i feel a bit left out now <laughs> you just have but... to be feeling really really terrible really crap. like you have to be like having the worst experience of your uh -huh. life i mean yeah it's 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 funny isn't it with those kinds of spiritual experiences is that and eckhart warns about this of, of getting too attached to the experience and, and and wishing to have it back and it's so beautiful and, and it's hard sometimes to to go from that kind of experience to the muggle world living in the muggle world it's yeah. like having to pretend <laughs> to be a muggle and um I remember once you tech when we first sort of started chatting and you text me and you said something about I was like oh how's your day and you were like oh it was awful I was just in muggle land <laughs> I was like, muggle land. I yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit rough out there yeah, sometimes. It can. Um, no, I've completely forgotten what I was going to say about that. It's like a, it's like a drug, isn't it? It's like right. once you start connecting with this side of life and, and people who are, expand your consciousness and yeah. having conversations that expand your consciousness, then going back to like normal life is, is 
this is just tough and you're like why am I here yeah. and suddenly you, suddenly like there's no purpose and it just feels a little bit mindless and yeah yeah a bit depressing <laughs> well in in um expecting adam which is martha beck's memoir about her experiences of being pregnant with her son adam who has down syndrome and all of the magic that she experienced during that pregnancy um some of the stories in there are so extraordinary and amazing and there's one where she I think sees the feet of a being in front of her and it's the most beautiful these are the most beautiful angelic feet and she just hugs them and it is in such a state of love and bliss and perfection in the truest sense of the word that I think she says that for about two years afterwards she just wanted to die so she could get back there Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it can be so you would think that it's this blessing but actually you just think ah how like you know how can I live in the in the normal world but of course this is where we are and um I think that's what's so beautiful about Eckhart's work is that it's it's about the it's it's not about these heightened experiences and it's it's certainly not about chasing mm-hmm. a quote unquote spiritual experience um although they are lovely <laughs> when they happen but finding the the beauty that's within and beneath and inside this field of the now yeah that we're always in and also it's finding the beauty in the pain of it as well because Mm. it can be such a I mean it's funny like I never would ever go back to not living this life but it's also been the most painful thing in the world to like go there right to go there um but there is so much beauty in that Mm. and it's you know it's the thing that we all probably run away from until we are brave enough to go there yeah um because it's scary but there is so much beauty in that yeah, in that pain yeah. as well yes there is so much pain and actually my and and that phrase going there you know I was a bit extreme in the beginning what happened for me was that um I published my book Lost in Austin and I was like okay now I'm a writer mm. now I'm going to start writing books I'm going to sit down and come up with some ideas which mm. is just not how it works <laughs> no. right so I just sat there at my desk going come on yeah with ideas and I'd come up with an idea and I think it was the best idea ever for about a week and then I'd realize it was terrible (laughs) and I'd start again and it would go round and round and round and round and I was just like up dealing with my demons all the time and I thought this is weird Mm. what the hell is going on here um and so I decided that instead of trying to come up with an idea for a novel I would try and, and get to the heart of what was getting in my way and my idea for how to do this was to lock myself in my room with a key, actually lock the door <laughs> and sit there with my journal. And that's, that's how it began. And I, which I just went in, I went right mm-hmm. in to the darkest places that I could find. And then I would like lie on the bed and cry and then go back in. And occasionally I'd go out, you know, <laughs> I think I, I stopped actually locking the door after day three, but um, it was a very, very intense period. And it was then that was probably about there was probably about three months of that before wow. leading up to my awakening, which happened as a result of watching Jill Balty Taylor's TED talk, my stroke of insight, um, and just be and that's actually hilariously another um, instance where my mum sent me the video and said you should watch this, <laughs> and I I started to watch it several times and I thought oh this woman's voice is so annoying <laughs> <laughs> oh this is so annoying I'm going to turn it off and so I, I probably started and stopped it about three times before eventually watching it and after you know you get over I got over her voice which mm-hmm. I don't find annoying at all now um and then it just blew my mind I mean it literally blew my mind I and I was like that I want that the way that she describes what she calls right brain perception and what Eckhart calls consciousness. It's like, that's it. And so then instead of trying to deal with my demons, I sat trying to figure out how I was like, okay, so instead of writing a novel, I'm going to write a book that when you read it, will flip a switch in your brain and it will 
get you over into right brain consciousness. Mm. And I don't know how to do it, so I'm just going to imagine that it's five years in the future and I've already done it, and now I'm just going to see what I've written. And so I sat in my room, like, clutching my crystal necklace that Amisha Garioli um, had made um, and was sort of, you know, trying so hard to tune into this future. And I couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it, and was so frustrated, although I could feel my energy was um, getting very, very intense. And mm. I was in this kind of very heightened state, but I just couldn't, I couldn't get anything, right? I was trying to feel into it. And I thought, oh, screw this, I'm going for a walk. Um, put on my coat, you know, open the door, walk up the steps. I'm like, Phew. and that's when it happened. Wow. And it was like being on some kind of drug and my whole, my perceptions changed. And mm. I went, I know that I went into right brain perception partly because when I got home from my walk to the park and my epic experience with the trees, when I got home I was completely fascinated with my hand. But in particular, it's 3D, the way it was in space and I was kind of staring at my hand I was like, I have to draw it, I have to draw it. And I got, and I hadn't drawn since, you know, high yeah. school art. And I got it out and I was drawing my hands and, um, and it was years later that I found Betty Edwards' book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, which oh, wow. explains that it's getting into right, it's, it, it's getting into right brain mode. Mm. The innate is the difference between like a mediocre artist, visual, like painter, painter, drawer, drawer? Mm. That's not a word, <laughs> is it? Um, uh, and, uh, and a quote unquote good one. And so what... What's next for you and for Unsung Lily? Wow, that's a good question. You've just I'm moved sure. back to LA. <laughs> yeah, so we've basically been um, hiding out in the desert for two and a half years, mm. creating and mm. very much been on this journey of like growth and figuring out who we are and mm. who we sa- what we sound mm-hmm. like and written this album that's just come out into the world. And now we've, yeah, we've moved back in back to LA and it feels like stepping back into visibility and mm. ba- back into yeah. kind of connection there was it was very like very much a time of like we didn't really see anyone or speak to anybody really um much and so now it's been so nice to be back and just be experiencing what LA has like we've been going to see lots of live music and mm. making really good connections putting together a team of people to work with yeah. and um so yeah it's just the, the next steps is just reaching more people I think yeah yeah Yeah. well I'm very very happy that you're back in LA yeah me too (laughs) (laughs) and inviting me to things like sound baths with a sound bath with Akashic record reading that was cool yeah yeah bring it on (laughs) um you're the only person who invites me to things like that and I absolutely (laughs) love it so thank you very much for moving back um and I I can't wait to see what you do next. And now hopefully you'll come back and chat to me again soon. Yeah, definitely. And I can't wait to see who you interview next. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 